Richard uh, is the uh, co-founder and president of Third Millennium Ministries. Uh, you can read about that. There's a, a detailed bio in the uh, in the brochure here. He taught for many, many years at, uh, at Reformed Seminary uh, prior to that. But uh, his vision has always been uh, much, much broader than just a mere local thing. It's, it really is global and worldwide. And we are, we are very, very grateful to Richard uh, for all the help that he and his colleagues have, uh, have brought to us here. Uh, they really are at the, the cutting edge and the forefront of um, producing excellent, excellent material in, in uh, theological education. Uh, I've known Richard, I think it must be a good 17 years, uh, perhaps, perhaps 18 years, since uh, we first met when uh, I was working in London at the Proclamation Trust. Richard uh, came to speak at one of our conferences, has been back to many since, and uh, we've, been, we've been good friends since then, and he's been just a, an enormous personal support and a, and a real, real help to our work here. So it's, it's a great joy and privilege to, uh, to have him this morning and to introduce him to you. Richard, come on out and uh, let's uh, hear what you're going to say to us. Yeah. You're very, very welcome once Thank again. Thank you. Thanks very much. Hi, everyone. Do you need to stand for a moment? Why don't you stand for a moment? Stretch. We're trying to keep to a, a schedule, but at the same time, if you go to sleep, there's no reason to keep to the schedule, right? This is, by the way, if you need a bio break, this is your opportunity to slip out quietly, okay? And um, unobtrusively. That's not much stretching, but that's okay. I know I need to stretch. Is that me? Okay, great. Thank you very much for coming out this morning, and thank you, Andy, thank you, Willie, thank you, Charles, for allowing me to have a few moments to share in this time. I promise I will do my best not to bore you, but I won't bore you for very long, I can tell you that. How's that? I can promise that part of it. Uh, I want to tell you just a little bit about Third Millennium Ministries and how it got started and how my understanding of it and vision of it has changed recently because I think it fits into what we're talking about here. I was professor of Old Testament at Reformed Theological Seminary for about 23 years, 25 years, and along the way, because it was such a, an easy job, and being a professor is an easy job, by the way, very easy, not like what most of you are doing who are in pastoral ministry, which is a horrific job. It consumes your life. Uh, because of that, my wife and I had opportunities to travel in different parts of the world every holiday, and we did. And as things changed in the world out there where we were traveling primarily to do evangelism, especially in the former Soviet Union, as the, as the former Soviet Union changed, suddenly the people there, the church there, stopped wanting me to come and to teach, uh, rather to do evangelism, but rather they wanted me to come and start teaching, training their pastors. I mean, you're a theological professor, please come over and do that. Reluctantly, I began to do that. And in places like Mongolia, Siberia, Poland, Czech Republic, places like that, okay? It was rather bizarre, but nevertheless, I did. And... I had an epiphany. And the epiphany was this, that where the church is growing the fastest in the world, there's the least opportunity for leaders to learn sound theology in the scriptures. Think about that for a moment. That where the church is growing the fastest in the world, there's the least opportunity for the leaders of the church to learn the scriptures and sound theology. And that really is what gave birth to third millennium. I... I just decided that this was not only wrong, but it was immoral for me not to devote myself to helping the church develop its leaders in places where they had no access, no access. In fact, if you look at the patterns of growth of the church over the last 50 years, and you go from the least growth all the way to the top, if you flip that chart over, take it from the fastest growing, put it down on the bottom, now you have the order of where the least theological training is taking place. And you know where we are on that chart of growth, don't you? There. Do you see it? Down here at the bottom. So flip it over. Think of all the opportunities that are available to people in your country and in my country where the church is not growing very rapidly. There's plenty of opportunity, but out there, there's very little opportunity. And so that was the burden of my life and 
We are now in our 20th year at Third Millennium. We're going to celebrate two weeks, um, our 20th anniversary, and God is blessed over these years. But as that has happened, as these 20 years have gone by, something has happened in my homeland that we should all have been aware of happening, but you know how that is. You tend to not notice until something hits you in the face. And now we're quite aware of it. So third millennium, rather than simply thinking of, let's get, let's get theological education, let's get training for pastors out there in the places where there's not much opportunity, we now see, and for a number of years now, have been very committed to the idea that we need to do something about what's happening in the United States. And I'm going to discuss with you in a few moments what I think has happened in my country that leads to that conclusion. Titus chapter 1. I'm sure you may not have a Bible. Maybe you do. I see a lot of electronic Bibles anyway. So good. Good for you. Good on you. I'm just going to read a passage here in Titus chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. To Titus, my true child and in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior, this is why I left you in Crete so that you may put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Let's just stop there in verse 5. This book, this letter of Paul, is one of those that we often call the legacy. The legacy of Paul, his legacy epistles, they include 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. And why? Because Paul's old at this point, and he's thinking about his protégés, first Timothy, and he's thinking about now, in this case, Titus. And his focus is on what's going to happen with his ministry, with his mission effort, now that he's about to leave the scene. We don't know exactly when Paul wrote this letter, but it is certainly in later in his ministry. And... As a result, he says certain things to Titus in this book that I find fascinating. The, as you look at this book, this little letter that he writes to Titus, there are lots of things that are said here, but did you notice what was right at the front? Right at the front, at the top of the list in this epistle. It was that you make what's left that needs to be set in order, and what's number one? Appoint elders in every town as I've directed you. Leadership development. Leadership development. Number one. Now, I have been in pastoral ministry and I know what it's like. I know that, in fact, we're even taught that real ministry is done by the laity. Right? In our circles, Ephesians chapter 4, we all know this, right? Apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and why? To equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And so our tendency naturally is to focus on and focus our attention as pastors and as local church leaders on the laity. Well, I'm so frustrated because I can't get them to do the job. And so I end up doing it all. And we see our goal of preaching and teaching and counseling and visiting and all the other things we do as trying to get them to do the work of ministry so that the kingdom of God can move forward. Well, as important as that is, don't ever forget the first half of what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 about how we get the laity to do the work of ministry, and that is through the leadership of the church. And when you go into a new place like Titus is doing, a place where there were churches that had been established, in fact, by the apostle himself, but is struggling and waiting to be developed. Number one priority was leadership. Now, let me suggest to you that while this was fresh territory, as it were, novelty was involved, and so it's necessary to focus on leadership, let me also suggest to you that it's necessary to focus your attention, my attention, church leaders' attention on the development of church leaders' when the church need to, needs to be revitalized. Now, I come from a part of the United States, you can probably tell by my accent, where they say y'all, and where family is important. In fact, family is so important that you better not criticize any member of my family. I remember one time after I brought my parents to live with us in Florida, down in Orlando, um, 
some man, I don't, oh boy, why did he do this? Let's just say my dad's not the best dresser in town. And he might brought my dad to church, and someone in Sunday school class with my father sat down next to him and said, you know, I think you need a new tie. Now, he didn't, he didn't mean to be rude, but he was rude. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> my dad was hurt by this, older, he was probably 75 at the time, and of course he had a tie that was probably this wide on that morning, okay? Probably had stains from the food that he had eaten for over the last hundred years. And this man was trying to help him out. You need a new tie, brother. Well, I knew the man that had done this. And so after my dad was crushed by this and started telling me about this before worship began, I spotted him. And as soon as worship was over, the first thing I did was I went to that man and I said this. I said, don't you ever criticize my father again. This is my family don't you talk about how my father is dressing. But of course, you know what I did on Monday morning, don't you? I went out and bought my dad a new tie. And I said, Dad, this is the tie you wear now. We're throwing the others away. See, inside the family, you can critique each other, you can help each other, you can point out what's wrong and that sort of thing, but don't do it from one family to another. If you're not part of the family, don't be criticizing us. Okay, so here I am. I'm not a part of your family. I don't live in Scotland. I've been here a number of times. I've been to UK more than that. And I sort of know you, but I really don't know the inside of what's going on here. So I'm not coming as someone who's an expert on what ought to happen in Scotland or in the UK. I don't know. And I certainly would not criticize the way you dress. I would not criticize the way you do theological education or the training of your leaders. But what I want to do this morning is talk a little bit about my family. That's the Church of the United States and what I see there. And if you find it appropriate to apply some of that to you, great. If you think I'm just not stupid American, fine. If you think I'm a prat, thank you, Terry, <laughs> then, um, then just ignore me. When Terry, uh, this, this past Sunday, I was supposed to be preaching at the Tron, and Terry back here, um, preached instead, and you should go online and see his little intro. At the intro, he says, Richard can't come because the weather's bad, the plane's not going to make it. And he said, well, I'm sorry for this, but I'm not an American, I'm not a professor, I'm not six feet tall, I don't have a beard, and I'm not a prat. (laughs) (laughs) And as soon as I saw that, I texted him immediately, because someone showed me the video, and I text him immediately and say, I hate to tell you this, Terry, but you are a prat. <laughs> with one T. With one T, not two. <laughs> okay, so if you think that what I'm saying is not appropriate for you, then please just ignore it. This is not a critique of you. This is my experience of living in my branch of the church. I'm in the Presbyterian Church of America. That's the conservative Presbyterian Church, the larger one in the United States. Largest, in fact. And a lot of you have probably know some of our heroes, our leaders. You know, I can mention the big names like Tim Keller. Are you impressed again now? Okay. Now, now you know. Okay, now you know what church I'm a part of. And I did teach at Reformed Theological Seminary that has something of a reputation over here. I went to Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia. Okay, so we're in. Okay, now you know what family I'm talking about. This denomination of mine began some um, 40 years ago. And in the first decade of his existence, it was hailed by the experts, by the experts, as the fastest growing denomination in the United States of America. Oh, we were so glad for that. We did not know what to do. We were just, it was magnificent. We just thought we were everything that God wanted the world to wanted for the world, everything that the church ought to be because we're the fastest growing denomination in the United States of America. Now, just three years ago, the Pew Research Foundation analyzed, and if you don't know the Pew Foundation, this is mega global first class research center, and they came out with a report that you may not have heard of because we certainly don't talk about it. They analyzed the various denominations in the United States, asking the question, what is the mean or average age of the membership of those denominations? 
what was some 40 years ago the fastest growing denomination in the United States is the number one oldest denomination in the United States. The mean age of the PCA is now 58.2 years old. We are older than the Episcopalians. We are older than the mainline liberal Presbyterian church. We are older than the United Methodists. We are older than every single denomination in the United States of America. Now, if you had a business and your customer base was 58.2 years old, you know what you'd be doing. You'd be putting up a going out of business sign. Or you'd be changing. How is it that a denomination becomes so old? Well, young people don't come. And where is the problem? What's the critical piece? Well, I want to suggest to you that what Paul's telling Titus here in this passage, at an, in a new territory, is also the same problem when the church dips like that. Leadership. 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 But we have the schools. We have the ones that you've heard of before, even over here. We have the scholars. We have the professors. They write the books. You invite them over here for your conferences. I'm one of them. <laughs> so, what happened? Well, what I'm convinced of is that theological education in my country and especially in my denomination took its eyes off of what is necessary to have the kind of leadership in the church that enables the growth of the church. And we did that in good faith because prior to recent decades, the old way worked fairly well. Let me describe to you the old way. The old way was basically this. You rely on the church to notice when people are rising, when they have gifts, when they have the call of God on them. You go to the elders, you interview with them, and they say, yes, you have the call, we agree with that, you should go off now to theological education because you're a good guy, you have all the right pieces, you're a fit, you have the call of God on you, now just go get educated and you'll come out and you'll be able to do ministry and we'll be delighted to see that happen. <clears throat> but why did that happen? Why were they able to rely on that system in the past? Largely because in the United States of America, like here, in the past, you could rely on a lot of broad, general, cultural mores and structures and patterns to provide the kind of life support for these young men who could then just go off to theological college and get some icing on top of their lives and then be prepared for ministry. I mean, most of those young men, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, grew up in stable homes. Most of them had fathers and mothers who, even if they weren't Christian and even if they didn't love each other, even if they weren't madly in love with each other, they stuck it out. Say, yes, I know those kinds of people. They grew up in a culture that said that there are certain moral convictions you ought to have or you're not an acceptable person. Oh, infidelity occurred, but that's not really acceptable. Stealing occurred, but mm, it's really not acceptable. We know the difference between men and women. Life was fairly stable, even though there were exceptions, especially in private life, and even though not everyone was Christian, it was a highly Christianized culture, America. In fact, we used to speak of our civic religion as being Judeo-Christian, so that when you drop back to the default, when you drop back to uh, what we all sort of agree on, more or less, here in this country, what was it? It was, well, it's what the Bible says, the Ten Commandments. 
I learned the Ten Commandments in public schools in the United States. I memorized the Lord's Prayer from my fourth grade teacher. I memorized in, my, in grade two, year two of my elementary primary education, I memorized Luke's account of the Christmas story. That was the world in which I grew up in. But quietly, <clears throat> over the last 30 years, 25 years, American culture has changed radically. We no longer have as our civic religion Judeo-Christian. We no longer have those kinds of stabilities in family life. In America, we don't even know what a man or a woman is. There is no agreement on something as fundamental as what marriage is. And this is the world in which current young people who are rising to leadership and future young people who are rising to leadership in the church, this is the world in which they grew up. <coughs> now, looking around this room, most of you grew up in the old world. Your children and your grandchildren are growing up in a new world. A world in which their friends do not go to vacation Bible school. A world in which the parents of your children's friends are themselves doing illegal drugs at home. Now, those illegal drugs in my country are becoming legal. A world in which, no, the Ten Commandments, I, can't even, I don't even know what they are. I've heard of such, but could I recite them? Mm -mm, no. There's something in there about adultery, I think. These, this is the world in which our rising leadership is growing. And even though we may believe that they're not affected by it because they're Christian, because they have faith in Christ, I hate to tell you this, but they are deeply affected by it. And in my 26 years of teaching and theological education, I saw with my own eyes in private conversation with promising students in the seminary how vacuous their lives were because of the culture they were growing up in. They had come to saving faith in Christ, hallelujah, they were committed to Christ, hallelujah, but they did not, they came from broken homes. They had themselves been involved in such immorality, it just would take your breath away. They themselves had been involved in things like drug abuse. They were thieves. They were everything that you could possibly count as being contrary to Christianity, and it was what they grew up in. Now, when Paul is writing to Titus, he's Basically telling them, go to Crete, hang out there, work your work there. Pay attention to leaders is very important. Um, but you know, Crete at that time had a bad reputation. And I'm sure those of you who have taught through the book of Titus know this. You know, the Cretes are barbarians and that kind of thing. Basically what it meant was Crete was like Las Vegas. It was not a sophisticated place. It was not a place where Judeo-Christian values were held in high esteem. It was a nightmare. And so you know that the people who grew up there, even if they had come to Christ, you knew that they were scarred, deeply scarred, by that Christian culture. And so I think it's fascinating when you think about that cultural background for that island, how the Apostle Paul describes the sort of leadership that he wants Titus to establish in the church. And I think the parallel to my world in the United States and perhaps yours is striking and makes Paul's list of the qualifications of leadership that we'll read in just a moment ever so important for us. So let's read it for just a minute. Remember in verse 5, he says, This is why I left you in Crete, 
so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Now, when by the time we get to verse 9 where he's talking about doctrine and teaching and rebuking those that are heretics, we're in. We're in. Because that's what training for leadership in the body of Christ is all about, isn't it? Taking people who grow up in a broad Christian society who already have embedded within their psyche, even by the non-Christian culture, the basic morality of Christianity, they know that it's not good to do this and not good to do that. Oh, they're good people. They grew up in stable homes. Now what we, all we need to do is send them off to a group of experts who went to school a few more years than they will, and then they can get the right doctrine, and they can rebuke those who have false teaching. but certainly not in Crete. Out of these some 14, 15 things that the apostle lists here, did you notice how little, how little they have to do what we have done in traditional theological education? The last one, I'll grant. And it is a very important one, of course, to know the truth of Scripture and to teach that truth and to be able to contradict or rebuke those, refute those who contradict the truth. Oh, so utterly true. I mean, I've made my whole... If you don't think I believe that's important, then just remember, I've made my whole life out of that. This is the way... This is bread on my table. But I know something about my country that makes it today a lot like the island of Crete in Paul's day. And that is, it is rare for people to grow up already having the character and the skills that are necessary for ministry that he lists here. Hospitality? When was the last time you saw a class on the roster of a curriculum of a theological college that was entitled Hospitality? Not pugnacious or polemical? Well, we find someone who's polemical or pugnacious, we lift them up and call them apologists. Like a good fight, you're an apologist. You need to get out there and start doing it. Pick a fight. It's great fun. Good reputation? Not a drunkard? You see, brothers, sisters, what I'm trying to say to you is is that in my country, there has been such a radical cultural shift that people come to theological education, traditional theological education, unprepared in their character, unprepared in their skill set, but we still think they're going to be ready for ministry if we just add the icing of academic theological education. But as I had my ministry at Reformed Theological Seminary, it was always interesting how this happened. Occasionally, as, after students put down their binoculars through which they were looking at me in the front of the room with 120 people in the room. Yeah, that's, is that Richard Pratt up there? Yeah, I think it is. I can't get him in focus. See, I was mentoring them, you understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is he. Okay, good. A few of them would venture forward after the end of class and they would always ask, several of them would, you know, this happened every week or so, they would say, Do you, can we have some time together at some point? And so they, there was this thing that uh, they talked about the Pratt Walk, yeah, with two T's, <coughs> okay, the Pratt Walk, which meant at lunchtime we'd take a walk, this person and I. 
Now, you might think that those Pratt walks were all about, what's the difference between superlapsarianism and infralapsarianism? Or can you, can you go over the documentary hypothesis of the Pentateuch one more time? I didn't quite get the difference between the Eloist and the Yahwist. Can, can you do that one more time for me, Rich? I wish that were the kinds of things they talked to me about. But it became so regular to the contrary that I could almost predict what was happening. And here is what almost every single one of them for 10 years came to me to have that private conversation brought to me in tears crying out for help. Richard, I am addicted to pornography and I cannot break it. Richard, my parents are going through a divorce and it's killing me. Richard, I'm gay. And so, of course, I would say to them, well, don't worry. By learning your theological lessons, all this is going to be fixed. (laughs) Do you hear what I'm saying? Western culture has gone from this Judeo-Christian context within which perhaps it was appropriate to take young men who were heading for ministry and simply send them off to a school to learn some serious academic matters from experts in the fields. Okay, I got it. I could possibly go with that 75 years ago, 100 years ago. But today, the need for paying attention to this list is ever so important because they don't have it. In my country, I'm convinced we've replaced the civic religion of Judeo-Christianity with the civic religion of Eros. So that the number one inalienable right that people have in the United States of America, their basic, most fundamental religious commitment is that they have a right to fulfill their psychosexual needs. And the greatest blasphemy, the greatest heresy, is that you would say, no. You don't think that influences the young people that are rising in your church as leaders? You don't think that that has corrupted them at the core? You don't think that that has robbed them of fundamental mores that you grew up with? It has. It is rotting. So, in my opinion, my humble opinion, in my country, we need a radical renovation of what we consider to be the kind of educational, developmental is the word I prefer, developmental process we need to observe for the training and successful development of leaders in the body of Christ. Let me tell you the easy part of those verses, this list that Paul gives to to Titus. The easy part is verse 9. The data. That's the easy part. The hard part is the others, and it's ever so essential today. So, brothers and sisters, I'm utterly convinced that what's happening here in this partnership that's developing, it's a three-way partnership that's developing here. First person, and in my opinion, the most important person in this partnership, this three-way partnership, is the local churches of Scotland. that you no longer outsource the development of leaders for the church to a set of experts who live in a building somewhere. You no longer send them to monastery. Rather, you are the ones who teach them. You are the ones that provide for them the full-orbed education and development that they need. Not just cognitions, but their behaviors. And not just their behaviors, but their emotional life. Most of you went to theological college. Did you ever have an experience where they invited your spouse to come in one day and to tell the professors what you are really like at home? Can you imagine doing that? Did you ever have a situation where your spouse came with you to a theological professor in the theological college and he sat down with you and he said, Sister, let me tell you something about your husband. He's a Neanderthal. 
And now that pornography is piked into your house, he is going to be so tempted, he needs help. And you, sister, are the only one who can help him. Now, here's my wife. Let's talk about what you're going to do about that. Did you have that opportunity in theological college? I never did. And yet in my country, ministers are dropping off the map because they're working for 10 minutes on their sermon online, switching over to a pornography site, and coming back. And they're so stupid that they don't even know that somebody knows that that's happening. And then when the elders of the church discover it, everyone is scandalized. And I say, why are you scandalized by this? This is the world they grew up in. This is their life. They need your help. But theological college doesn't do that. When was the last time you heard of a traditional residential theological college speaking to the husband and the wife together about what kind of father he is? Does he pray with his children? Does he pray with you? I'm sure that a lot of you who are married, perhaps while you're in theological college, hope that no one asks you, do you pray with your wife? And so, of course, when you get into ministry, all of a sudden that begins? No way. So we are in a situation today that we did not face 50 to 100 years ago, where this common civic religion supports the Christian faith. Instead, our cultures, mine and yours, have radically changed. How has it changed? Well, it's changed toward Eros, but it's also been changed because of massive immigration. Now in my country, like yours, because of massive in- immigration, the theme of the day is tolerance. You can't be different from other people. You certainly can't step out in the public arena and say, my religion is the true religion anymore. If you're Christian, now if you're another religion, you can. But if you're Christian, you can't. You have to just simply say, well, you know, this is my opinion. When you live in that world, that brings up the problems in ministry. Our men who are moving toward ministry have got to be taught in a much broader way so that their heads, yes, get the right doctrines. Never diminish that. Never diminish that. And I would say, just as an aside, the curriculum of third millennium has more data in it than you get in a normal two-year program in a theological college. We know this because we began making our lessons by actually using recordings of classes with permission, and we would revise them and put them in, and we discovered something that surprised us, that every hour of the third millennium curriculum was equal to two and a half to three hours of classroom performance. So when you go through the curriculum at third mill, which has the equal number of contact hours, you actually end up getting two and a half to three times as much data as you would by sitting and listening to lectures. It was amazing. We were shocked by this. So I don't believe we should lower the amount of data. I do think we should find ways to make it easier for people to get. More effective acquisition and more effective retention, I believe that. And that's why we do it the way we do because there's all kinds of scientific evidence for how to increase the efficiency of of acquisition and the retention. And we follow that evidence. But I'm much more concerned that by making it a more efficient data transfer and a more effective data retention, that what this does for a situation like Corn Hill and a situation like your local church, this is what I'm really interested in, is it opens up space, it opens up time, for the human-to-human contact to actually deal with real life, the broad matters of life that we didn't have to address so much in the past, but are front and center now, the moral life of the student, the spiritual life of the student. Do we even care that our students, as they develop into the leaders of the church, know how to keep in step with the Spirit. That they know what it means to walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh. Do we even care? 
Well, now you have the opportunity right here in Scotland with this partnership between your church, Cornhill, Scotland, third millennium, to have space to actually deal with those things. Now, here's the wonderful thing, brothers, because many of you are in church leadership right now. <sighs> this is one of the wonderful things. When you open up your church to this, when you join in as one of those three partners, it's going to benefit you so much you won't believe it. Because every time you talk to that young man about how he's treating his wife and his children, you're going to be reflecting on how you're treating your wife and your children. When you help them with their prayer life, you're going to be helping you with your prayer life. When you help them learn how to reach out to their neighbors with the gospel of Christ, it's going to inspire you to reach out to your neighbors with the gospel of Christ. And here's the wonder of it all. Remember how the purpose of leadership is to motivate and to equip the saints to do the work of ministry? <laughs> when you and your rising leaders begin to exemplify these qualities, they will begin to imitate. Why hospitality? Well, certainly for the leaders to be hospitable himself, to invite others in, to spread the gospel, that sort of thing. But do you know what scares your people from being hospitable? Why when they have their party, they only invite their closest friends and family? Why they don't invite the Sikh living next door or the Muslim living two streets down or the gay couple across the street? Do you know why they don't? They're terrified. They're terrified. Absolutely terrified. But when they see you and your young rising leader doing that, and realize that you didn't die. Okay, you didn't die. How about that? He had the gay couple across the street into his home for a Christmas celebration, and no one died. I can't believe it. They will suddenly realize they won't die either. That inviting a Muslim into your home doesn't mean they're going to pull out a knife and cut your throat. I can't believe it. When they see you doing it because you're engaged with your young leader on this broad spectrum of matters, they will begin to do it too. My denomination went from being the fastest growing denomination in the United States of America in less than a generation, in less than a generation, it is now the oldest denomination in the whole of the United States of America. And do you know why that concerns me? Because... I actually believe these things. I believe what my church stands for. I believe in our doctrines. I believe these things so very much that I don't want to see them pushed to the side. I want to see them propelled forward. I want to see them propagated. I want to see the glory of Christ come through the teachings of my branch of the church. That's how much I, I, mean, I am living for that. And for that reason... I am going to be a part of a revolution in the way that we train our leaders. Amen? Amen.